Don Valentine, the founder of Sequoia, walks into a room. The person waiting for him in the room is about to become the world's greatest founder ever. A truly iconic founder figure. But right now, he's a nobody. And as Don Valentine recalls, that guy smells odd and looks like Ho Chi Minh. Don Valentine ends up investing in the person's startup and starts a massive chain of investment successes for his firm Sequoia Capital. Who is the person he meets on that day in that room? It's Steve Jobs. This is the story of Don Valentine, a person that up until his recent death in 2019 helped shape the venture capital industry like no one else. His firm Sequoia was an early investor in the likes of Apple, Cisco, WhatsApp, Airbnb, Zoom, LinkedIn, PayPal and Google among others throughout its 50 year history. Its investments are now worth trillions of dollars in public market value, an undercover business title few people are aware of outside of the Silicon Valley. Old school values, an incredible work ethic and leadership par excellence. Don Valentine's story offers great learnings for upcoming venture capital fanboys. It's all about winning. Don Valentine is the son of a truck driver and comes from humble beginnings. His parents are uneducated and neither of them have even finished grad school. But in good Catholic fashion, they do value education and especially religious education. And so Don grows up in New York going to Catholic schools and ends up going to Fordham University. He graduates in the early 1950s and promptly gets drafted into the army. Don has a very negative attitude towards the military. I don't want to join the army. He doesn't like regimentation and he does things his own way. But one thing that he loves is electronics and technology. And he ends up getting put in charge in the army of trying to teach senior officers to use modern technology. So instead of fighting wars with horses and men, try using modern technology. He feels like a grandson trying to teach his grandmother to use an iPhone and thus doesn't get comfortable in his role. He transfers to the Navy and gets stationed in California. This is a major turning point in his life. When he comes out to California, he steps off the boat and makes it clear he's not going to leave. I have reached the promised land. It doesn't snow here in the winter. I'm never going back to the East Coast. I love this place. After a short stint at a company called Sylvania Electrics, Don takes a job at Raytheon in LA. A job that would greatly shape his skills as a legendary venture capital investor. Raytheon is one of the big five. That's not these boring auditing companies before one of them committed suicide, but one of the five major defense contractors. Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics and Raytheon. Don is working in the high technology industry selling computing solutions to these defense departments in the military. In parallel, as every nascent gorilla should, he starts taking part-time courses. At the business school at UCLA, he focuses on sales and marketing in order to further develop his sales skills. But after some time, he feels it's time for a change. He ends up getting recruited to move up to Northern California and join a fresh startup. A really hot semiconductor company, Fairchild Semiconductor. The company that built the first silicon integrated circuit. The incredible growth and demand for silicon is Fairchild's fault. Because Fairchild was the company who pioneered the idea that silicon was actually the most effective material to use for semiconductors. Here, Don knocks it out of the park like you would expect from a proper giga chat. He is selling Fairchild semiconductors to defense contractors down in LA and takes the company from a couple million dollars in sales to over 150 million in annual sales in just a couple of years. And 150 million back then is massive in today's dollar terms. We can just hope he had a proper revenue sharing agreement in place. He gets promoted and ends up running all of sales and marketing for Fairchild. And if you pay attention closely, you already notice how all of this 
this will be helpful to his VC career. Nowadays, semiconductors are used for all kinds of products. Back then, they were used for none. It was similar to today's crypto boom. Without the Reddit degeneracy, a new paradigm was being established and Don is at the forefront of it. There's one problem though. Every time Don acquires a big new customer, needs slight adaptations to the product they are selling or is entering a new market, he has to get the approval of the company's board. And there are much more potential buyers than they can service. Don wants to take advantage of the upside. He makes an ambitious plan and pitches it to the board. His pitch? Invest in some of their customers. Fairchild Semiconductor could help build up these young companies so that they become bigger customers in the future and taking advantage of an equity upside at the same time. But the board's reaction is disappointing. Absolutely not. That's a crazy idea. Who would want to do that? But Don wouldn't be Don if he would give up like that. He starts investing himself. Essentially, he becomes an angel investor. Whenever he works with a Fairchild customer that is a young company with growth potential, he chips in some money from his personal balance sheet. But as myself and many other angel investors know, there's a big problem. We only have so much capital. You want the money? Is we rich? Look. We're not rich. You're rich. We're broke. If only he could manage a bit of OPM, other people's money. This is where serendipity completely strikes. If Don hadn't made this move, it's seriously doubtful that there would be a Sequoia Capital and there may not even be a modern venture capital industry as we know it today. After a short stint at National Semiconductor, Don gets approached by Capital Group with an offer he cannot refuse. Most of you young ambitious gorillas might be aware of financial institutions institutions like Goldman, KKR or Apollo. Capital Group is a bit more under the radar, but guess what? Their AUM is 2.6 trillion US dollar. Having been founded in 1931, they are one of the world's oldest and largest investment management organizations. Their offer? They learn from Don all about this private angel investing he's doing. And so they make a suggestion. How about you do this full time, leave National Semiconductor and work at the capital group. We'll provide the capital, you provide the expertise. Deal. Peter? I'm with them now. It is 1972 and Dawn leaves his sales job to finally become a full-time VC at a time when venture capital is hardly an established industry. On the, at the outside, maybe $50 million nationally was the available pool of money to finance new companies and that's in the early 70s. He starts working with the capital group and the capital group sets up a new $5 million fund for their clients who want to ape into these high risk, high return startups in the semiconductor industry. By the way, if you want to ape money into startups at some point too, I recommend to you my side venture toolkit. It gives you not only literally hundreds of inspirations on what side ventures you can build, but it also gives you detailed instructions how to to build the side venture of your choice without needing to code, how to grow it through clever growth hacks and how to run it on the site next to your classes or job. I guarantee that if you put the work into it, this side venture toolkit will help you build a side venture that generates at least $1,000 per month. But, and this is the beautiful thing about side ventures, it has the potential to scale up much more than just 1000 bucks. If you put forth the work, your side venture can turn into your main venture eventually. On top of everything, you get access to a community of side venture builders, brainstorm ideas, ask experts for advice or find co-founders. Our ultimate goal with this is to build a side venture incubator where everybody can get equity in high growth projects. So by buying the toolbox, you go on a long journey together with us. It is released now and early buyers get a discount. If you cannot afford the price, there is also a scholarship offer for people without money. Click the link in the description below to check it out. Don starts making investments on behalf of Capital Group. In parallel, he starts working on creating his own company and raising his own venture fund. The company's name? Sequoia Capital. The Sequoia tree, the redwood tree, are the foundations of 
growth in Northern California. They grow fast, they grow big, and they're very dramatic. And I was indirectly trying to imbue the companies in the fund with those kind of credentials. But fundraising proves to be harder than Don thought. Even though he has a good track record and working experience at one of the biggest financial managers at that time, it's tough. The reception he gets from potential investors in his fund, so-called LPs. Well, this doesn't sound like the investing business, you know? This isn't fixed income. To which Don replies, exactly. This isn't the investment business. This is a company building business. In a Funny story, he goes to see Solomon Brothers, the investment bank in New York. He sits down with the bankers and gives them the pitch. The only thing they say, well, we see that you didn't go to Harvard Business School. To which he replies, right, I didn't go to Harvard Business School. I went to Fairchild Semiconductor Business School. <laughs> but the bankers don't deem that too funny. They are not going to invest with anybody who didn't go to Harvard Business School. A massive mistake for Solomon Brothers balance sheet. They will get slaughtered by the financial crisis, rightfully so. It ends up taking Dawn almost three years while working with the capital group to raise the first independent Sequoia fund. But finally in 1975 it happens. Sequoia launches with a small first fund estimated to be between 3 and 5 million US dollar. Also here the fund focus is clear and the nature of work is not really comparable to anything that we know from today's venture funds. Back in the 70s even before I joined and in the 80s. We were building the infrastructure of what is now called the internet. Once Don gets started, he sets what he calls a few ground rules for investing. Even to this day, many of these rules deeply influence how investments are being done at Sequoia and why it became the elite institution it is known as. The Sequoia Capital Investing Checklist. You must be in a very big market. The potential investment must be in Northern California. It must be in an advanced technology. It must have a high gross margin ability. It must have the potential for Sequoia to make a hundred million dollars return on the investment. And lastly, the startup must be positively responsive to Sequoia's active participation. So Sequoia influencing business and helping them grow. And one of the most important aspects of the venture capital business, providing value to startups after acquisition, is an obvious superpower of Don Valentine. He is able to take his portfolio companies to the next level by helping them do sales and marketing and go to market or augment their finance and accounting. And his first deal is an immediate success. The startup was about to become a pioneer in arcade games games, home video game consoles and home computers. The company's products such as Pong and the Atari 2600 would help define the electronic entertainment industry from the 1970s to the mid 1980s. And the investment tied perfectly back to Don's experience at Fairchild Semiconductors. Our first investment was a company called Atari. Don invests $600,000 in the company in 1975 and the very next year the company ends up getting acquired by Warner Communications for $28 million. Buddy. Sequoia makes a quick 4x return. That's a great IRR, but does fall short of the 20x that Don is hoping to achieve in the long run. This is followed by his investment in Apple. And although Sequoia, represented by Valentine, invests in Steve Jobs super early when nobody else is willing to fund him. Without exaggeration, I would say that every meeting with Steve was a showstopper. The deal is simultaneously one of Sequoia's biggest L's. It is one of the reasons Sequoia just some months ago completely remodeled their entire business structure. What happened, of course, is a feeling that many Wall Street bets virgins know way too well. They sold too early. Sequoia prematurely ejects Apple from its portfolio. The position is closed in 1979, before Apple's IPO, for roughly $6 million. A healthy return, but shockingly low, considering that the firm today sits at more than 2.5 trillion US dollar market cap. 
Sequoia could have made billions, but as we will see later in the video, they learned their lessons. Probably one of Dawn's most successful investments happens in 1987. Dawn invests two and a half million in a little company started on the GSB campus called Cisco for 30% of the company. 12 years after the constitution of Sequoia Capital, Don has learned his lessons. He's not letting this one go. So not only does he fully finance the company upfront with two and a half million and gets 30% of the company, the company then goes public shortly thereafter at a market cap of 224 million. And Don stays on the board. He doesn't distribute the shares. He remains chairman of the board until the mid 90s. Sequoia writes Cisco up and makes enormous, enormous returns on the company. And that will prove to be the playbook for Sequoia Capital going forward. Alongside all these investments that they are making, Sequoia keeps raising new funds. The funds steadily grow in size, from that first fund of 3 to 5 million to around 150 million per fund in the 1990s, raising a new fund every three years or so. But Don realizes that you cannot possibly invest in all these companies and give them all the time and attention that they need to become successful. It is simply too much work. So during the 70s and the 80s, Valentine grows the business, hiring a small but hungry team of individuals around him. Well, I think it all started with Don Valentine, who had uh, two lessons that were pivotal in my mind. One was really an appreciation for markets, and second, an ability to recruit non-conventional people. He recruited Mike Moritz, Right after he recruited Mike, he hired me. They go on to do a lot of deals and invest in the likes of Cisco, Oracle, Google and Yahoo early making significant gains. One of the success recipes during the hiring process, they look for people with functional experience in a startup. For example, design or application engineering, product, marketing and sales and so on. Don Valentine knows that sometimes the most amazing companies like Apple, Cisco look crazy and you you need somebody that's willing to see the potential behind the craziness and stand up for them. And oftentimes that's not folks who are coming from Harvard Business School. Fast forward to the mid 90s. Don Valentine is looking back at an amazing track record and establishing the foundation for what's going to become the world's most notorious venture capital institution. But now Don sees that it is time to pass the ball to the next generation and the control of the company is passed to two men that were going to become tier one silverbacks in the venture capital ecosystem, Doug Leone and Michael Moritz. Beyond Sequoia, Don's fondness for rain-swept Scottish golfing vacations, Pebble Beach, the Oakland Raiders and the accomplishments of Tom Brady is apparent. For many years, he is a devoted supporter of the Stanford School of Engineering and helps orchestrate the Stanford Engineering Venture Fund, which becomes a model for universities across the nation. He's also a keen supporter of medical research. Less well known is his affection for the San Francisco Opera, where he was a longtime member of the Guild, and the San Francisco Symphony, where he serves as a member of the Board of Governors and an enthusiastic backer of its leader, Michael Tilson Thomas. In his later years, Don is a ready source of advice for those who stop by his office. Unlike most former leaders, he resists the temptation to criticize decisions which he considers misguided or to meddle in the business. Ever curious, he relishes spending time with young people brimming with ideas about the future until the very end. He understood the true value of we, he understood the true value of a partnership. Whatever you do, you have to set out with an objective of winning. Winning doesn't mean necessarily being first. It's not like running the 100 yard dash. It's a performance constant so that over time, 
You're in a productive and predictive environment with partners you admire and judgments that you're proud of. But it's all about winning. And that's what we try to do here.